scripture reading this morning is taken from Luke's gospel. I'm reading from the 8th chapter. Listen now to God's word. Jesus and his disciples sailed to the region of the Gerasenes, which is across the lake from Galilee. When Jesus stepped ashore, he was met by a demon-possessed man from the town. For a long time, this man had not worn clothes or lived in a house, but had lived in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell at his feet, shouting at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, son of the Most High God? I beg you, don't torture me. Now, a large herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside. And the demons begged Jesus to let them go into them, and he gave them permission. And when the demons came out of the man, they went into the pigs, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and was drowned. Now when those tending the pigs saw what had happened, they ran off and reported this in the town and countryside, and the people went out to see what had happened. When they came to Jesus, they found the man from whom the demons had gone out, sitting at Jesus' feet, dressed and in his right mind. They were afraid. Those who had seen it told the people how the demon-possessed man had been cured. And then all the people of the region of the Gerasenes asked Jesus to leave them because they were overcome with fear. So he got into the boat and left. And the man from whom the demons had gone out begged to go with him, but Jesus sent him away, saying, Return home and tell how much God has done for you. So the man went away and told all over town how much Jesus had done for him. May God add to our understanding of that reading from God's word. Amen. No, this story we just heard is such a powerful story. Even though in some ways it is typical of so many stories about Jesus. Jesus was never afraid to challenge the conventions of his society. He openly associated with people who were considered to be outcasts. And he did so even though it was scandalous to the religious elite. Jesus went to where the lepers were sequestered. Hallelujah. Amen. <laughs> he went to where the sinful hid. He went to where the handicapped looked for a handout. And he restored them to health and gave them the chance to start a new life with him. Hallelujah. Now in the story we just read, Jesus met a man possessed, where the townspeople had incarcerated him. In this case, a graveyard. Now it's important to know that in those days, a graveyard was considered to be like a nuclear waste dump was considered to be contaminated, and it was the place you put contaminated people. But Jesus didn't pay any attention at all to that. He walked right up to this tortured soul in whom evil and madness raged, and in a confrontation of epic proportions, Christ's love and light ejected all the darkness in that man. And he was completely healed and redeemed. Now at this, you'd think there would have been a huge celebration, wouldn't you? Story says some of the local herdsmen rode like Paul Revere and told the whole town about this spectacular miracle that had happened. You would think that the whole town would have been amazed and thankful that the Gadaraville horror was over. 
But instead, for some strange reason, the townspeople were all terrified. And they actually begged Jesus to leave. What were they so afraid of? Why did they fear Jesus for exercising the evil from their midst? Well, maybe part of the reason is that sometimes people just learn to live with obscenity, with what are sometimes called necessary evils. And the people in Gadara just kind of shrugged their collective shoulders and acquiesced to the situation. The story says that they tried to keep him in jail a few times, but when that failed, they were just glad when he stayed out of sight, out of mind, in that graveyard. And so this man who was unclean by virtue of his mental and spiritual oppression was kept at arm's length. He was something they could deal with as long as he stayed where he was. And this is where that old saying might have come from, the one about Better the devil you know than the angel you don't. Well, this points to a particular tendency of both our modern culture and sometimes even the church. In our modern culture, there is this tendency to separate ourselves from people whose lives make us uncomfortable. There's a guilt factor, I think, when another person's problems call my own comfort or success or health into contrast. Maybe that's part of the reason why we have hospitals for the sick and homes for the elderly. Years ago, New York City created a way to get thousands of homeless people off the streets and out of sight even though it really didn't attempt to help them out of their homelessness. And so we have women's shelters and drug rehabs. Now, before I go any further, clearly it is not that these places are a negative thing in themselves. God knows, and so do we, that there are times when professional and well-equipped help is absolutely necessary to ensure the quality of life for people in need. But on the other hand, our culture openly encourages ideas like youth should last forever, and the infirmity of any kind only proves that someone isn't trying hard enough. In my ministry, I have seen way too many people that have just been left in a home for no other reason than to keep them out of sight and out of mind, even by their families. And so this tendency to create distance between people goes far beyond the realm of when someone's condition makes us uncomfortable. This story in Luke 8 and the following one raises an even more insidious issue. This story, and many others in the Gospels, raises the issue of distancing from someone based on who they are. See, there were people in the Jewish culture of the time who were considered unclean, abhorrent, based on their race, or their nationality, or their gender, or any kind of disability. Even what some people did for a living could qualify. And so this goes way beyond simply keeping people out of sight for my sake, or for the sake of my comfort. It made it acceptable even in the community of faith to detest and despise other people, so much so that they were considered to be less than human. 
that kind of systematic hatred of other people has been the source of so much bloodshed and strife throughout the ages. The ability of any religion or any ideology or nationality to create and foster such hatred is one of the most pervasive and horrific elements of our human history. This past week, we saw another instance of that kind of hatred, didn't we? It was perpetrated by someone who became convinced that the people in that church prayer meeting were less human than he. The obscenity of that kind of supremacist ideology may be hard for us to conceive. And the tragic irony of it is that the victims were in truth more authentically human because they're followers of the most replete example of what human beings are called to be, Jesus Christ. Truth is, living the way of Jesus and incarnating his love is this world's hope for peace and wholeness. It is what God wills for this world. Those were the kinds of truths that comprised the theme that pervaded the prayer vigil at Baber AME this Thursday night. In this story and throughout the Gospels, Jesus calls you and me to reject the false teaching that any human being can be considered less than another for any reason. And why? Because every human being is created by God in the image of God and God's declaration from the beginning concerning our creation was, it is good. In this story and throughout the Gospels, Jesus calls you and me to cross every threshold that divides us from our neighbor. And to do so in fulfillment of the new commandment to love as Christ loves. In this story and throughout the Gospels, Jesus calls us to love with our hearts. But even more, to help others with what we have to give and to love and respect others as if the other is Jesus himself. That's the meaning behind that parable in Matthew 5 when Jesus commended the servants for ministering and pay attention to the list for ministering to people who were homeless and destitute and couldn't afford decent food or clothing and for ministering to people who were strangers with different customs and appearance, and ministering to people who were mentally and physically ill, and for ministering to people who were convicted felons who violated other human beings in some way. And in the parable, do you remember what the servant said? They said, Lord... When did we do all that to you? Jesus replied, When you did it to the least of these, my sisters and brothers, you did it to me. And so Jesus calls you and me to break down the barriers, whatever their source, in service to his gospel of love and healing and salvation. He calls me to concentrate more on the imitation of Christ than the worship of Christ. Jesus calls me to follow him wherever he leads. And this story suggests that maybe one way to gauge if I'm on the right track is if the risks of following Jesus outweighs the comforts The truth is, how that will look for each of us will come in many shapes and sizes. 
long time ago, John Calvin said that while every Christian has the call to live out our discipleship to Jesus in word and deed, he went on to say that we each have our own kind of living assigned to us. In other words, our Christian calling can be served in any situation or role that I have, where I work, where I live, where I shop, and more. Our vocation is always composed of who I am in Christ and whatever I do for Christ. So this story calls me and you to stand up against the lies that divide people from one another. It calls you and me to expose the lies and demonstrate the alternative out there in the world. The church of Jesus Christ simply cannot re retreat from the racist, supremacist, consumerist, and elitist messages that are being perpetrated all around us. We simply can't afford to keep our light under a bushel of complacency or timidity anymore. There's just too many lives at stake. And there is one more thing to receive from this story. You know, I've always wondered why Jesus didn't let the man who was healed join him on his way. After all, the town made it pretty clear that they didn't want him around anymore. Well, I think the reason is that this man is called like I am called to minister where my life is. It was because the best way to follow Jesus and to make a difference is when people who know me can see the difference that Christ has made in my life. You see, Jesus performed a great reversal in this story. Because the religious system of his time believed that sin was contagious. That a faithful person's job was to keep away from the sick and the poor and women and children and Gentiles and tax collectors and many more. But Jesus deliberately hung out with all those people lab labeled as unclean and sinners and healed them body, mind, and spirit, restoring them to a right relationship with God. And then he invited those very people to follow his way and to embody his truth and his lifestyle because to do so would spread God's kingdom everywhere. Holiness is God's powerful, cleansing, and inclusive power that changes people like you and me. And whenever we follow Jesus and demonstrate the new life of Christ, it is contagious. It changes other people's lives all around us. And for that, we can give thanks to Almighty God and so this week, there are two responses I think that this story asks us to consider this week. What comfort zone is Jesus challenging me to deal with today? And when God reveals that to us in response, demonstrate God's inclusive love to someone who needs it this week. Amen.